So I am Vatsal and welcome to my talk on drop impact forces. I work with Detlef Lose at the Physics of Fluid Group and this work has been done in collaboration with our, uh, with our colleagues from Tsinghua University and all the experiments that you will see are done uh, by them. So drop impact is a very common phenomenon and we can really see it everywhere we, we, if, if we look around. But the one I like the most is when Scott Kelly went to in the International Space Station and played ping pong with, uh, uh, with water droplets. You can see here that he's literally playing a, a table tennis using uh, water droplets, which deform every time it impacts these uh, hydrophobic uh, paddles. So uh, one question that uh, we as physicists might ask is how much force does uh, he need to apply on the paddle in, in order to keep it stationary? Uh, all right, so we, what we can do is, so in this talk, we are uh, specifically going to uh, look at this, uh, this question. And for that, we can model this uh, drop impact process by imagining a drop which is falling on a super hydrophobic uh, substrate like this. So it is falling with a velocity V0 and it has a diameter uh, D0. And there are some uh, uh, fluid properties for uh, namely the viscosity and density. And of course there is surface tension and coefficient between uh, the drop and the, and the surrounding. So with these uh, uh, variables, what we can do is we can define our impact par uh, parameter, which is uh, the Weber number or, or for the impact. We can also define other uh, dimensionless numbers, uh, namely the uh, Onizog number and the density ratio. Uh, what we do in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this work is that we keep the Onizog number, which you can see has uh, viscosity, inertia, as well as surface tension of the, of the droplet. If we keep this number constant to, uh, uh, to this number, which is essentially uh, the Onizog number for a, a two millimetric diameter uh, water droplet. We also keep the surrounding Onizog number and the surrounding density ratio constant in order to uh, simulate uh, air, essentially. And all these, uh, uh, let's say, the simulations has been done using this open uh, source software called uh, Basilisk, which is written by, uh, by Stefan Popine. And I, I won't go in details of the software, but if you want, we can always have a, have a talk about this. So this is a typical uh, drop impact case that I will show you uh, uh, time and again during the talk. On the left-hand side, I will plot the log 10 of the uh, viscous dissipation, uh, uh, which is, which is uh, here. And, and on the right-hand side, I will plot the uh, velocity, uh, normalize with the impact velocity. And we do, uh, we take the log 10 of the viscous dissipation in order to isolate the reasons of uh, high viscous dissipation. So I will just uh, play this uh, video once and you can really see this uh, very nice uh, drop impact process where the drop uh, uh, impact spreads and then it recoils and then uh, takes off uh, because this uh, substrate here is, is super hydrophobic. So what we can do here, here, the question that we asked is we want to understand, we want to measure the forces on this, uh, uh, on this substrate. So for that in experiments, what we can do, we can just uh, um, uh, add like a, a quartz uh, force measuring sensor at the substrate and we can measure that force directly from the experiments. And in the, uh, in the simulations, what we can do is we can uh, solve this integral, which is nothing but a, but a pressure, uh, pressure force, which is acting on the super, hydro, uh, super hydrophobic substrate. So I will, uh, without further ado, I will just show you one, uh, uh, particular case where we can uh, look at force as a function of time. And first of all, I mean, there is a remarkable uh, uh, match between experiments and simulations. So I will play this video once more because I really like this video and, and just look at the different uh, features that we can reproduce from the, uh, from the simulations. And I, I guess for uh, most of you, the first uh, peak in the force is, is, is quite intuitive because it comes in because of the uh, inertial shock that comes up uh, when the drop impacts the substrate. But the second peak is something that we will also focus uh, in, in, in much detail in this, in this talk. Uh, so, but, but, but before that, the first peak, as I said, is because of the inertial shock on the, on the substrate. And uh, then uh, if you move forward, this, uh, as the drop spreads, it's, uh, this, this force uh, goes down. So the first question that we can ask, by the way, is what sets this F1? So the first peak that we see here, uh, what exactly is, is setting this, uh, this F1? And for that, uh, we look at the two time instances. One is T is equal to zero when the drop is about to impact. And then at T is equal to T1 when the force uh, F, uh, is, is maximum at, at F1. And what we notice here is that most of this droplet is still moving down with the velocity uh, V0. And so essentially what we can say is the force F1 is nothing but the uh, rate of change of momentum, which is dm dt times uh, V0. And this uh, uh, rate of change of mass, uh, we can, we can uh, associate this mass flux with uh, uh, density times velocity times the uh, diameter. This would be diameter uh, squared, by the way, uh, over here. And that's essentially will give you uh, F1. And uh, if we just uh, rearrange these terms, then we get this F1 as, uh, as the inertial uh, pressure times the square of the, uh, of, the, of the diameter. 
And and if we if we now plot this uh, a dimensionless f1 as a function of Weber number, then indeed we see that uh, when the Weber number is high enough, so when we are in the inertial regime, that this uh, force uh, goes to a constant value, which is 0.81 in these in these units. And again, we see a very nice agreement between experiments and simulations. Uh, you, you you must have noticed this uh, this change uh, in this this reason, which is in the low Weber number uh, regime. So what we expect is that uh, there we also have an influence from from capillarity. So we can uh, essentially uh, uh, use dimension analysis to uh, make like a, a add a small uh, capillary correction to this uh, to this force and it also matches quite nicely I, I won't go into details of how we do this but we can uh, discuss it later on uh, so now uh, that that was uh, the magnitude of the force f1 but the second question that would uh, come up is when does this f1 occur so for that we just look at the uh, at, at t1 which is nothing which, which should nothing be but uh, but the ratio of the inner uh, it should be the inertial uh, time scale basically which is d naught over uh, v naught and uh, what we do here by the way is we plot this uh, as uh, uh, t over uh, this inertial capital time scale. I will I will uh, come to this later on why we do it like this. Uh, but in these, uh, let's say, uh, uh, dimensionless time and Weber number, uh, this ratio essentially tells you that uh, this this uh, should be sort of scale as one over square root of, of Weber number, which indeed is what we see both from experiments as well as simulations. And this uh, black line, by the way, uh, comes from the asymptotic analysis that was done by uh, Gordio et al in this uh, JFM, which is which is a, which is a very nice read, by the way. So. What we see is that uh, if the force F1 and, and T1, we can we can uh, relate to the impact parameter that is a Weber number. And if it was a super, uh, if, if if it was a hydrophilic substrate, that would have been the end of story, and this drop would just keep on spreading forever. But since we are using a super hydrophobic substrate, uh, this force uh, has a second peak, which is this F2, and then at a time T2, and this happens because in order for the drop to take off, it has to uh, exert a, a force on the substrate uh, just because of the of, of Newton's third law of motion. And if uh, if we move forward, essentially this drop will take off after after some time. So that that will happen at time uh, t three. So uh, this is essentially the uh, the complete picture once again. And what we can do now is we can uh, ask the question that okay, uh, how, how, what sets this uh, uh, time t two? So when does this uh, f two occur? And and for that we can uh, essentially think about drop impact as uh, as as analogous to to a spring mass system, which was which is nicely explained in this paper by uh, David Perry uh, and and collaborators, which is contact time of a, of a contact of a bouncing drop. And there they claim that okay, uh, this uh, uh, the time period of of this drop impact should scale with the uh, capillary oscillation uh, frequency, which is nothing but this inner cell capillary uh, time scale. And, and this uh, we can do, this analogy we can look at as essentially uh, this way that, okay, once this uh, impact happens, there's a spreading phase, which goes from zero to a TM. And if we plot this TM also on the same uh, time scale, we notice that this uh, TM uh, scales with the uh, with the inner cell capillary time, uh, uh, time scale. And this is why I wanted to plot this as TI over this inner cell capillary uh, time scale. And uh, the second stage of this process would be the recoiling stage. And this is the stage when uh, when the when when, when the uh, the, uh, the motion goes from being predominantly in the radial direction to predominantly in the in the vertical direction, and this happens uh, to be the instant when we have t two. So this uh, this time also scales uh, uh, directly with this uh, inner cell capital time scale. And of course, there is this uh, third uh, third uh, period where essentially this drop takes off, and and this happens if if it if, if it was a symmetric uh, drop oscillation. Uh, then uh, we would have seen, uh, uh, let's say, a symmetry in this uh, in these time scales. But since there is a asymmetry because of the of the substrate, we see that the uh, the final stage is essentially uh, the half of the uh, time period, and then this uh, drop takes off. So so that essentially tells you when this T two occurs. So this T two is also it relates directly with this inner cell capital time scale. Now, uh, what about the mag magnitude of the second peak, which is the second interesting uh, question? So we we understand the time. Now we want to understand the magnitude of this uh, second peak. And for that, uh, if, if we go to the low Weber number uh, regime, so we, we, we talk about uh, these uh, guys here, and this is the essentially a capillary regime. So if I uh, show this uh, impact process and we measure this uh, forces, you will notice that, okay, of course, there is a first peak because of the inertial shock, but then there are these uh, capillary oscillations uh, that, that keep happening, and there can be even more than two peaks. So now in this case, for example, you see that there are a four, uh, five local, uh, local, local maximas here. And these are essentially different capillary oscillations, and that's why we call this regime as as a capillary regime, where this uh, this force uh, uh, is, is is like this. Then there is a sig uh, there is second regime which happens in uh, between, let's say, uh, Weber ten to uh, thirty, and this uh, this is uh, uh, what we call a singular jet regime. The reason. Uh, 
we do that for that let's let's look at this uh, data point here which is at weber number 9 and another thing to another interesting thing here is that in these regimes uh, the the second four peak is essentially uh, higher than uh, the, even the first one so uh, remember uh, the first peak was roughly around 0 0.8 and these values are are more than one so so these these forces are even higher than the than the first peak that you can also see here so of course this is the this is the first peak again and then if we uh, go forward in time, uh, we, we also notice these uh, mini capillary oscillations, which is uh, reminiscent of this uh, uh, these, these pyramidal type uh, drop rates uh, that was studied in this, in this paper. And then there is a flow focusing because of this uh, uh, capillary waves, which creates this air cavity here. And this air cavity is, is also reminiscent of, of uh, bursting bubbles where uh, such capillary waves come together, focus and form this uh, singular jet. And this, when the singular jet forms, there is a, 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 a sudden rise in this uh, force, which, by the way, uh, you can see is, is higher than the, in the than even the first peak, and that's uh, F two uh, for you. And then, if we uh, if we move forward, then of course this drop will also take off just just like the uh, the, uh, the previous case, and that's at T three. And if we if we look at the uh, process, it's it's essentially uh, it looks like uh, like this. And this is uh, and this this uh, this this uh, uh, high peak essentially happens because of this uh, very nice capillary uh, uh, conver uh, ca the converging of these capillary waves that happens at the axis of symmetry. And you can also uh, appreciate that by looking at the uh, dissipation uh, uh, magnitudes, which is uh, which really takes off, which is really high at the instant when when these waves uh, converge at the axis of symmetry. So uh, we can also uh, think about the boundaries of this uh, this regime. So uh, namely uh, these two uh, cases here. And if we if we plot uh, this uh, 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 like that, and you can look at the the forces, then you can see that uh, let's say uh, to the left of this regime there are still many capillary uh, oscillations, and then uh, there is of course uh, some uh, uh, evidence of focusing flow focusing over here. Then this flow focusing really takes off when when we reach this uh, particular uh, resonance uh, uh, Weber number, and then of course it, it again goes down. Then we go to the right of this uh, uh, regime. Another thing to notice here is that uh, the, the moment when this uh, force is maximum is also the instant when this uh, uh, bubble has, has a maximum uh, uh, entrainment uh, diameter. So you can see that there is no bubble in this case. There is uh, no bubble in this case, but there is a, a, a large bubble in, in this case. And notice that this uh, uh, this Weber number regime is, is, is quite, uh, is, is not that large, right? Uh, then moving on, what we can see is that there is, of course, this uh, inertial regime where uh, where this F2 all is, again scales with the uh, in, in inertial uh, pressure. So I will, um, in the interest of time, I will just play this video and uh, move on. And I'm gonna skip this uh, drop splashing regime where this force actually, uh, there, uh, it goes down in experiments. And the reason for that is in experiments, when we go uh, beyond uh, a critical Weber number, a splashing occurs and these, this drop rate breaks down into uh, tiny, tiny uh, satellite droplets here. And the force essentially in the experiments decreases, but whether, whereas in the simulations, which are axisymmetric in nature, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, so in summary, uh, we looked at the uh, time variation of this force and we identified two, uh, two peaks. Then we also uh, tried to answer that when does this, this peak occur? So we looked at the time at which they, they, uh, they happen. And then we, of course, also looked at the magnitude of this, this force and divided the parameter space into uh, in, in, into four regimes. And just to uh, close this discussion, uh, the, uh, the last thing that you can ask is uh, coming back to the question of uh, how much force does Scott Kelly has to uh, apply. So, uh, so that's essentially the inertial uh, uh, pressure force for, for this, uh, for most of the cases. And for that, we can, if we normalize that with the, with the mass or with, 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 the, with the weight of the droplet, then we see that it ha he really has to apply a force which is, which can be two orders of magnitude higher than the weight of the, of the, of the droplet. So with that, I thank you for your uh, attention and I would now uh, be happy to take questions.